this diagnosis, which could be a dangerous one, is always in a differential, pretty much in almost every age group. So, it's any frequent but significant cause of lower abdominal pain, usually associated with reduced venous return from the ovary, either due to mass, hyperstimulation, especially in patients who are um, on uh, stimulation uh, to try to get pregnant, um, and actually with hemorrhage. The clinical presentation can often be very non-specific and can only really uh, cause a delay in diagnosis and surgical management. So, I don't know if it's just me, but a lot of time in my experience, um, especially in patients who are either in colic or severe pain, um, usually uh, pain that's very intermittent, they have a characteristic uh, visual when you see them from across the room, all right? Um, and I kind of refer to this as the colic carousel, okay? So this pretends obviously to females or males with a lot of hair. What does it look like? Kind of like this. <laughs> All right? So as you can see, usually the patient is rolling around in bed. Obviously they have no time to take care of their hair. So they're usually up in a standard motion as such. All right? There's obviously variations based on the different types of hairstyle. <laughs> but this is what you normally see. So a lot of times these patients are either very sick, crazy, or both. All right? So some variations that you can see a little bit matted to the side, um, patient is screaming, a little bit subtle over here, or last night was the party was really very good. Okay. So, going back to a very torsion and passive physiology, you have to understand the blood supply. Because pretty much it's a lack of blood supply to the ovaries causing pain. Alright? So, the majority of the time you'll see that there's a dual blood supply, and this is very important when trying to diagnose a very intrusion. Usually you'll have blood supply from the uterine as well as the ovarian arteries. A small percentage of the time is just the ovarian artery, and a very small percentage of the time is just the uterine artery. Okay? This is very important because sometimes, especially when you're diagnosing ovarian torsion, on the ultrasound you might have flow, but that doesn't mean that either torsion was its present or lack of torsion um, is not present. And therefore, if your suspicion is high, you should always make sure that it's on your differential and advocate for your patient. So now they did a wonderful job looking at the pathophysiology and the symptomatology of torsion. As you can see here, a symptomatic patient. On your left side, you have uh, a normal uterus with ovary and a pedicle, which uh, um, involves a suspensory ligament as well as the vessels. Now, if there, for example, there's a cyst, or a mass of budding in the ovary, which can cause it to twist on itself, leading to a very large edematous ovary. Okay? And these are the characteristics that you'll see on the ultrasound. Here's another example or illustration of a twisted pedicle with a very large ovary, pretty much decreasing the uh, venous return, um, as well as the lymphatic drainage. So, usually occurs unilaterally, all right? For the most part, it occurs on the right side. And why is that? Usually, the left-sided ovary is kind of, there's decreased movement because of the cecum on the left side. As such, the right side is really more mobile and thus more affected. And that kind of gives you a dilemma since a lot of these patients can have right-sided pain and so, therefore, you have to think about the appendix, etc. All right? So, during early pregnancy, you can always have and enlarged corpus luteal cyst, and that kind of predisposes you. So pretty much in all age groups, you should kind of think of this diagnosis. Um, in children where they have either lack of a measles saltings or a very enlarged uh, fallopian tube, um, or in patients who undergo tubal ligation, and therefore they have adhesions, and that can cause a nitis for twisting the ovary um, on itself. So patients present usually with Sudden onset unilateral pain, 25% of the time can be bilateral to kind of um, also give you a uh, dilemma in diagnosing these patients. Nausea and vomiting occurs in a large majority of these cases and therefore can give you, um, can be a, a red herring um, or a mimic of a GI source. Um, history of previous episodes may occur due to twisting and untwisting, and fever is late finding and usually a sign that the ovary is dead or necrotic. So, on physical exam, like I said, usually non-specific. However, sometimes you can feel a mass, 
or pelvic tenderness. However, it could be absent in about 25 to 30% of cases. And peritoneal signs are infrequent, the least advanced disease. So obviously, ultrasound is a diagnostic modality of choice. All right, so specifically looking at Doppler, and looking for flow. CT or MRI are used when ultrasound is non-diagnostic, the surgery is always definitive. So I know you two can be an over this bird, okay? <laughs> and all you have to do is think of a chocolate chip crystal. So, you see two things on this ultrasound. This is an endocavitary ultrasound. How do I know this? One, I put up a slide. Two, <laughs> these images are very high resolution, and therefore endocavitary is a high frequency probe with good resolution, which uh, sacrifices depth. So you have two structures here. You have your ovary, which is a hyperechoic capsule, and you have your follicles. You have another structure here, which is anechoic stripe, and this is the iliac vessel. Iliac vessels are very important in order to diagnose or try to figure out where exactly your ovary is because your ovary is always either medial and anterior to your iliac vessel. So medial meaning more midline and anterior meaning much closer to the probe as opposed to your iliac vessel. A lot of times you might have difficulty visualizing the ovaries because the patient either has a very large body cavity or there's a large amount of bowel in that area and that causes a lot of bowel gas and it actually disrupts the ultrasound waves. So therefore, your iliac vessel is very important to visualize. Okay? So usually you will use your endocavitary probe, you have the probe marker up towards the ceiling, and you're going to either bend left or right to look for the adnexa on both sides. It's always very important to look at both adnexa, as a lot of times ovarian torsion is more unilateral, and therefore if you're able to compare both sides, then you have a better chance of figuring out what happens <coughs> toward you. All right. Another example of an mm -hmm. ovary looks like a very simple or corpus luteal set if the patient is pregnant, and you have your stripe, which is your iliac vessel. Remember, medial and anterior to your iliac vessel. Okay. Any questions? Good. What so, plane? What plane yeah. is that? Was that what plane is this? Uh, this. So this is the uh, long axis. Um, so <coughs> the, if you're looking at it from a um, with the probe marker up towards the ceiling. Um, this sh should be um, in the sagittal axis, as you're looking at the long axis of the iliac vessel. So some of the grayscale features for ovarian torsion, um, these are some of them, but the more specific ones are one. The first one, which is an enlarged ovary, okay, greater than four centimeters. So the magic number is five, okay? So any ovary or structure that causes the ovary to be a mean diameter of five centimeters or more, um, increase your risk of ovarian torsion, and then free fluid, okay? So enlarged ovary and free fluid are the most specific findings that you'll see in ovarian torsion. Um, other signs that you can see are a string of pearl signs, which I'll show you in a little bit. Basically, the ovary is very enlarged and indebitous. It pushes all the follicles to the periphery, all right? Then usually you will have a mass coexistent with a twisted ovary. Um, and you can have a twisted vascular pedicle. This is very hard to visualize. However, if you are able to visualize it, it's pathognomonic. So, like I said, ovarian torsion can occur in pretty much any age group. All right. So, Eric, you want to do an ultrasound? Uh, which probe is this? Um, and if you look at it uh, back to back or side to side, 
you'll see that on the right side, you have this large over it. You put color flow over it, looking for flow, and there's no flow. Compared to the left side, you can see central flow. So, the most uh, common mistake is that a lot of times when you try to put flow over these ovaries, you try to look for flow within the middle, the parenchyma, okay? You don't necessarily want to look at anything in the periphery, it's not as important as central flow. That's most important. So this patient had a uh, torsion on the right side. So, another visualization. So, orientation-wise, this is the sagittal orientation. You have your bladder here, you have your very large ovary, and you have your very small uterus, as this is a child, and it's some free fluid. On this next picture here, you have this fluid right next to the pedicle, which you can see. Normally, you can't really see the pedicle at all. However, it's very enlarged and twisted, which is why you can tell this is a pedicle uh, versus a little structure, as it's uh, pretty much um, between uh, both pockets of free fluid. Here's another example. Large bladder. You have a cystic structure here, and right in the middle is a pedicle. So a lot of times you may not see this, but if you can, it's pathognomonic. It's almost it's called a snail sign. It's almost like a, a snail. <laughs> I don't know. That's what he said. Um, so uh, a magnified picture of it is that you have the pedicle, which is kind of twisted on itself. Now, if you put color flow over it, uh, it might look like a whirlpool sign, which is a uh, pathognomonic as well. It's pretty much the pedicle twisted on itself, and the venous as well as the arterial uh, uh, system is twisted on itself. Once again, another uh, demonstration, snail sign, and a vascular pedicle. So this is what it kind of looks like when you put flow over it. You, see, you have arterial as well as the venous system, and it's kind of twisted. Now if you uh, move the probe back and forth, it kind of looks like a whirlpool. Mm -hmm. Twisting on itself. Very hard to visualize, but if you can do it, then you're golden. So this is an example of a woman with uh, hyperstimulation with large follicles and a very enlarged uh, ovary. However, they still flow. Remember, just because they flow doesn't necessarily mean there's not torsion that's present. So what, we, what I normally do is if I find an ovary, I look for color flow and then Doppler. And looking for Doppler essentially within the parenchyma. You try to look for any vessels and looking for flow. So this left ovary, left hand side, as you can see, Doppler flow, and looking at the amplitude of the transmission is low as compared to the unaffected side where there's much higher amplitude. And that's such this is an arterial phase and there's flow to this artery and this flow is diminished for this um, ovary. Is there any significance to the fact that there's also like backflow, it seems like, in the torch ovary? Um, so, if there's uh, decreased venous return, which is much more specific um, than um, lack of arterial flow, um, then it's important. Um, a lot of times, uh, you'll always see like flow. You can even see flow sometimes here, depending on which uh, vessel that you choose, and, and that could be normal. Um, so, backflow or a lack of absence of venous return is always um, significant for ovarian torsion, no matter what that you see on um, arterial phase. Here's another example of a very enlarged ovary. You can see the follicles almost in the periphery, and you don't really see anything centrally in the central parenchyma. All right. Here's an example of uh, looking for flow over this ovary. You don't really see any follicles, and all this here is pretty much move motion artifact. All right, so there's no flow within this ovary. It's very enlarged, it's very edematous. So if you see this, you don't necessarily need to find flow, but your ear should perk up and say this person most likely has torsion or should be higher in differential. Another example of string of pearl sign, going all the way around the parenchyma, right over here. And this is a very large ovary. All right, so some, um, yes? Right, um, is there a reliable to way to, I mean, obviously looking at flow to tell a follicle from a vessel, but if, you're, if you don't think there's flow. I mean, you can, put Doppler, you can put either Doppler over it. 
a volatile won't have any return okay. for it. But neither will the vessel that's not getting any you, cause like exactly, so that's why you pick and choose. So okay. if you pick multiple areas and there's no flow, okay. there's no okay. flow. Okay. Okay. it could be multiple follicles that you chose by accident. But <laughs> right. if you have a very hard time visualizing it, then you know um, it's definitely hard. And so this study, which was done in 2008 um, in Israel, small study about uh, I believe 100 patients. Um, so the, these are all um, GYN physicians, and they had a special uh, floor where they pretty much did only GYN ultrasound. So this study included only patients who had suspected ovarian torsion was admitted to this floor, and their own sonographers who did GYN sonography all the time looked at these patients, and all these patients underwent laparoscopy for <coughs> diagnosis. Okay, so what they found is that the accuracy is only 75% of the time. So what does that mean? That means it's hard. Like they do this all the time and the accuracy is only 75% of the time. Consider like what we do or what GYN, GYN consultants do, they don't do it as much as they do. So therefore, the diagnosis of torsion is just very difficult, which is why you always should think about this um, on your different. And even if there's flow, if the, even if you suspect that there is torsion, then you should either admit these patients and advocate for them, uh, for either observation, or the patient should go uh, to the OR. But this is a discussion, obviously, with your uh, GYN uh, consultant. So, um, there's another article in Moore et al. 2009, uh, Journal of Emergency Radiology, looking at prevalence of CT findings in patients proven with ovarian tortures. For a like study, uh, about 100, 150 um, cases looked um, and it looked at public pathology. So basically what they found is that on CT, if you're able to visualize or have suspicions of ovarian torsions, then it's pretty correct and it really correlates with the ultrasound. However, if you're unable to visualize anything at all, then you can't really um, assess whether or not there's flow or a torsion and therefore they require um, an ultrasound. And that's what ideally what I do in my practice. Basically, patient comes in with low abdominal pain or pelvic pain, you should, in a female who is uh, childbearing age or younger, usually you should think of pelvic pathology first. So I'd rather usually do the ultrasound first and then CT second. All right? So, all in summary, um, torsion should be on a different from all age groups. Doppelpho via ultrasound may not rule out the disease. So it's very important that you always have this a differential, um, if in a flow is present when you get an official ultrasound. And you can look at it yourself. A lot of these patients sometimes, if you're either if they're pregnant or you're doing an ultrasound, then you should take a look at the anexa and visualize it for yourself. If you, just, if you see something, that's great. It might expedite the uh, patient towards the GYN consult. Um, if you don't need to see anything, um, if you see like just normal ovaries, that also helps you as well. All right. So enlarged ovaries and free fluid with or without flow are most common findings, and always be very vigilant for these patients because you have to advocate for them. Because a lot of times, the GYN consultant will say, Hey, she looks great, she's eating Popeyes, she's on her phone, and then all of a sudden, five minutes later, she's having pain. Okay? So, what, when your suspicion is high, you should definitely advocate for your patient and be very vigilant. All right? Because time is over. Any questions? Yeah, cat life. It's my cat right here.